During um, the late 1920s in Berlin, Lucy and Mahoney be began research that would eventually be published in English as 100 Years of Photography. Written during her exile in Britain, the book was published in 1939 by Penguin, and it was a short-lived bestseller. It sold about 40,000 copies in two years, and it was, I think, the first British publication to attempt a cultural history of photography. The book was only 170 pages long of the actual text, and addressed to a general rather than a specialist audience. Um, this is part of Penguin's policy of um, bringing topical issues and quality writing to a new reading public who are unable to afford more expensive hardback books. So launched in um, January 1936, Penguin set out to sell quality books for sixpence, turning cheap mass market paperbacks into a means for <coughs> popular education and cultural improvement. The series in which Mahoney's book was published, Pelican Specials, seen here, uh, was launched in 1938, specialising in science and the arts and intended to be topical and published within as short a time as possible from the receipt of the manuscript, as it says on the back of the book. Um, and specials could sell up to 100,000 copies. They also have penguin specials, which makes it a bit more confusing. Mahoney's perspective fitted well with the general orientation of the pelican and penguin um, specials. Like the others, her book had an emphasis on science, technology and empiricism, a left-wing orientation that was also internationalist and democratic. Yet Mahoney's book also introduced to a British readership the theoretical perspectives on photography um, that uh, were in circulation in the late 1920s and early 30s in Germany, in France, and among Central European artists and writers such as herself and her ex-husband, Lazio Mahoney Marsh. These theories centered around the question of how to account for technical and stylistic changes in photography. Matthew Witkowski writes that they were the beginning of photography history as art history, but I would add that this has to be understood in the context of the avant-garde desire to break down the distinction between art and the everyday. In Britain, Moholy was in contact with Otto Neurath, Viennese logical empiricist, anglophile and director of the Isotope Institute. And I think that's indicative of the way that Moholy brought these German debates to a new context that was especially receptive to ideas, new ideas, um, sorry, ideas relating to new technology and democratisation though rather less receptive to German metaphysical philosophy. The publication run of 100 Years of Photography was short. After the edition sold out in January 1941, no further editions were printed due to paper shortages, and also war had damaged the export market. So this is one reason why Holly's book has been largely overlooked in English language photography writing. It receives only passing mention, even in surveys of the historiography, <coughs> such as Martin Gasser's 1992 essay, Histories of Photography, 1839-1939, and it's misrepresented in Witkowski's 2009 essay, Circa 1930, Art History and the New Photography, where he cites Moholy as saying that a desire for photography dates from the earliest days of mankind. The sentence doesn't actually appear in the book at all. Um, <laughs> He even gives a page reference. Um, and her <laughs> emphasis is not on desire at all, but on early photochemical and optical experiments. Other writers have been kinder. Writing in 1996, Liz Heron Val Williams point out that the book makes some more recent attempts at introductory history seem parochial. In his own introductory book, David Bates, quite unusually, <coughs> cites Moholy in some depth. In addition to these general histories, there are, of course, all the writers who've studied Mahoney's archive, her photographic work, and her bi biography, among them um, Jordan, Robin, Schutenfrey, Rob Saxer, and Alden Bota. Um, Angela Madisani and Nicoletta Carabini's um, 2012 book, Lucia Mahoney Between Art and Life, includes an essay on 100 Years of Photography by Angelo Maggi. Um, this is the only study of Mahoney's book that I've come across. Um, Maggi uh, notes Mahoney's originality and breadth. Um, a Hundred Years of Photography is astonishingly, deta astonishingly detailed for such a short book, 
um, because she has this very uh, concise writing style. And he also notes her prescience in recognising the significance of wireless telegraphy for the future of photography. It's one of the most striking things about the book. And I think Maggie is right about the originality of Mahoney's analysis, and in particular, her excellent understanding of technical developments in the 1930s. But this isn't what I want to discuss here. Here I'm interested in how ideas from the German context take a specific form in 100 years, which is different from the form they will take in Beaumont Newell's writing, and of course it's his version that becomes much more influential. As a culture in the social history of photography, Mahoney's book was influenced by the groundbreaking work of Giselle Freud, um, whose PhD thesis was published in 1936. Freud's is explicitly a Marxist social history, and it's directly informed by Marx's 18th Brumer on Louis Napoleon. Um, but Maholi places much more emphasis on technique and technology. Her first argument is that light-sensitive processes and optics have been studied long before the 19th century, and she goes beyond the now very conventional discussion of the camera obscura to mention Chinese experiments with photochemistry, Arabic alchemy, understandings of skin tanning, and the theory of combustion. Her point is that while all periods made discoveries of this sort, only the early 19th century could have brought them into fruition in the specific form of photography. And she repeats, oh sorry, <laughs> she repeats the phrase, um, the time was, was right, with each repetition contextualizing the arrival of photography differently, how the invention was facilitated by enlightenment, industrialization, the developing capitalist free market, democratization, class mobility, secularization, and the rise of a reading public. In her use of this phrase, um, the time is right, Maholi echoes Heinrich Schwartz, whose 1931 study of David Octavius Hill drew attention to the historical and social forces determining the invention of photography. Schwartz rejected the emphasis in German scholarship on what Martin Gasser calls priority debates, i.e. Who, who invented photography first. And Maholi dismisses um, the priority debates too with this um, simple observation. Photography has been a compound invention, as most inventions are. So like Schwartz, like Freud, and like Walter Benjamin, whose 1931 essay, Little History of Photography, also heavily draws on Schwartz, Maholi emphasizes portraiture. The belief that some of the greatest achievements in photographic portraiture were by the earliest photographers is shared by all these writers, as well as by Emil Orlik in his essay um, on photography from 1924, which is in this book, and by Franz Rohr in his 1929 photo book, Photo Hour, Photo Eye, compiled with Jan Sikrond. Um, Schwartz emphasised the relationship between photographer and subject as one key to the greatness of the early photographs of Scottish photographers Hill and Adamson. Other writers followed suit, finding this quality also in Nadar's and Julia Margaret Cameron's early portraits. Freud attributes the quality of Nadar's early portraits to his close relationship with his models, while Holly says that Hill's success was dependent on the contact between photographer and photographed. And Maholi and Freud's writing are particularly convincing on the subject of portraiture because both of them are portrait photographers. Um, unlike these other writers, though, Maholi suggests that this feeling of warmth and contact is um, an aesthetic tendency, something shaped by romanticism. So, in this way, she not only places photography in art history, as Witkowski claims um, several European writers wanted to do, but she also denaturalizes early photography, suggesting that an image of intimacy doesn't have to be the result of actual intimacy. In the writing of Benjamin Orlick and Schwartz, the notion of a give and take between sitter and photographer in early photography is presented as a consequence of long exposure. So Orlick explains the effect of the sitter's stillness on the viewer by quoting Lucretius, describing a person in a portrait sat as if where it neither rains nor snows and no storm blows. He's actually quoting Goethe, he's quoting Lucretius. 
Um, this links the early photographic portrait to a kind of aesthetic transcendence because for, um, for Lucretius after Goethe, to be outside the storm is to be outside time and outside history, something that instantaneous photography can never achieve. So Orlick argued that long exposure enabled early photographs to capture a synthesis of expression. And this is a concept that he took from um, the philosopher Schelling, who in 1804 wrote that the ideal portrait is a synthesis, a composite of the individual gestures and moments of life that constitute a person. And then Benjamin quotes this part from Orlick as well. In her book, Mahali um, alludes to this argument, and then she provides a quotation from 1840, when exposure times were still a matter of several minutes. Um, everybody seemed to understand that there was a relation. As, oh, I've changed it on the slide. It's correct here. There was a secret relation between the young man and the box. The box with the short cannon-like brass tube and the sitter. Secret relation. So in this way, Mahali reads early portraits not in terms of transcendence, nor as entirely determined by the technology, but as a patient collaboration between humans and apparatus, a three-way relationship between photographer, camera, and sitter. So this is a key difference between Mahali's perspective and that of the other German writers. It's this pragmatic and careful outlining of technical and social phenomena and a refusal to be drawn into universal or metaphysical statements. <clears throat> there is a narrative arc shared by most of the Central European writers on photography in this period, which Witkowski characterizes as ascendancy, decline, and rebirth. We can find it in um, Rose Photo I essay, in Helmut Gosset and Heinrich Gutmann's uh, 1930 book on early photography between 1940 and 1970, in Schwartz's book and in Benjamin's essay. So this um, decline in photography is identified as um, setting in as early as the 1850s, spreading in the 1860s and 70s, and in some cases continuing right through the 1890s. And the moment of rebirth, surprise, surprise, is the moment of modernism, the new vision, and the neue Sacrakeit, or new objectivity. So all of these writers agree that, early co that that sense of early contact was lost as photographed subjects were turned into types by commercial carte de visite photographers quick to, who want to turn over their uh, clients quickly. They take the view that the rise of the retouching studios fed a growing taste for mediocrity and flattery. Maholi, for example, um, discusses the demands of customers so this is just a random um, member of my family. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Maholi, for example, discusses the dis demands of customers, the middle classes who thought that a smooth face suggested higher social rank. Orlick and Benjamin write in grander terms of a decline in authenticity or the destruction of tradition and aura. And Freud sees it in more specific terms as the influence, specifically in France, of Louis Philippe's notion of the juste milieu, the state reflection of bourgeois values, which was fueling rising mediocrity in art as well. Unsurprisingly, this analysis is shaped by 1920s and 30s politics, aesthetics, and technologies. There was a left wing political objection to retouching that associated it with the deceptive practices of the right wing press. Plus, there was a growing interest in straight photography and new objectivity, a growing rejection of pictorialism, the rise of fast handheld cameras and roll film, which neither required nor lent itself to the retouching of negatives, also a practice that both Freud and Maholi generally re rejected in their own work. The modernist antipathy to pictorialism can be traced to the work of Laszlo Maholi Nagy and his co-writer, Lucia Maholi herself. In his 1925 book, um, for painting photography film, Maholi Nash argued that photography should explore its own distinctive and mechanical modes of picture making, and famously he reproduces an Alfred Stieglitz photograph, which upset Beaumont New York quite a lot, captioning it, the triumph of impressionism or photography misunderstood. The photographer has become a painter instead of using his camera photographically. By 1929, uh, it was received wisdom that photography had been reborn when it liberated itself from this dependency on painting. 
Royal began his photo essay by identifying two significant periods of photography, the early years and the 1920s, separated by the wilderness years when it was diverted into mimicking painting and graphic art. And he argues that now photography has found its way again and a true visual culture is emerging to rid of photography of kitsch. Bossert and Schwartz imported this idea into photography history. Bossert, um, in his book, labels pictorialist images as kitsch, and he invokes the contemporary return to the strictest objectivity of sacrifice. And Schwartz argued that when photography aspired to the limitless world of painting and graphic arts, it becomes, quote, untrue to itself. For Roll and Maholi Naj, the photogram was a key means by which photography had broken away from conventional pictorialist genres, such as landscapes and narrative scenes. For Lucia, Maholi and Maholi Naj, the photogram, made by placing objects on or between a light source and photographic paper, enabled a new way of seeing, while at the same time being a direct recording, it seemed to exemplify the possibility that photography could underpin a new vision. So the photograph becomes emblematic of a crucial opposition in Maholi Naj and Maholi's collaborative work between production and reproduction. A 1923 essay, published under Maholi Naj's name, described reproduction as the reiteration of already existing relations that can be regarded for the most part as a mere virtuosity. But in the 1927 essay, he adds that reproduction can also be viewed as a practice no less important than art and associated with technical media. The opposition between production and reproduction clearly relates to the tensions in Germany between the demands of the left for a populist realism and the avant-garde ambition for a new vision. Both Maholis have been involved in communist and anarchist circles in which production had virtuous connotations through its association with industry, while reproduction of existing relations described the function of bourgeois ideology. Maholi's new, objecti Maholi's new objectivity for photography and Maholi Naj's new vision were oriented towards production in that they both rejected our historical genres and they were also oriented towards reproduction in their commitment to the technical medium. In their collaborative writing, which appeared under Maholi Naj's name, reproduction is presented as the ground of the photograph, its primary technical function and its, its, its distinctive character, the basis for creative production. So this dialectic of production and reproduction allowed for a recognition and interest of and interest in um, reproductive photographs without necessarily classifying them as art. Production meant a transformation and perception. Photography could make visible, sorry, quote, make visible senti existences which cannot be perceived or taken in by our optical instrument, the eye. Uh, as Mahoney Nash wrote, we now see the world with entirely different eyes. And Oliver Bultar has argued that the, these ideas are rooted in biocentrism, a movement influential in Germany, which in Maholi Naj's version didn't oppose technology, but took it as a means to expand the senses, to renew and rewrite the body. Such biocentric ideas appear in 100 Years of Photography. The last sentence, final sentence of the book reads, life without photographs is no longer imaginable. They pass before our eyes and awaken our interest. They pass through the atmosphere, unseen and unheard, over distances of thousands of miles. They are in our lives, our lives are in them. Body and photography merge, we become photographic. In fact, Maholi's interest in the dialectical relation between production and reproduction shapes the hundred years of photography throughout. Maholi's new objectivity rejected expression and subjectivity, linking the camera as an objective recording design device to a formalist vision. She reproduced her 1935 portrait of Emma Countess of Oxford and Asquith in her book, writing of how, and this is the same quote Jordan used, not only the shape, delineation, and expression of the human face, but the sculptural details of the head, texture of skin, hair, nails, and dress become attractive subjects to the photographer. However, a hundred years of photography is not concerned with assimilating photography's documentary and reproductive function into art. And the book reveals a fascination with all sorts of technical developments, such as microphotography, infrared, phototelephony, wire photos, stereo photography, microfilm, and instantaneous photography, amongst many others. 
In the 1930s, a split was being established between reproductive photographs and art photographs. Reproductive photographs could be recouped as art by being interpreted as forms of subjective expression, or else they could remain associated with weak or secondary claims to authorship. Maholi's own lengthy struggle to regain possession of and claim authorship over her Bauhaus negatives um, is um, symptomatic because they were, they were kind of treated as secondary to the Bauhaus designs they depict. So, to conclude, um, Maholi maintained her commitment to reproductive practices, both in her wartime work on microfilm, which is in itself a fascinating story, and in her treatment of the history of photography. Today, her discussion of the uses of photography in electronic transmission can be read as prescient, as Maggie argues, but it's also clear that Maholi's book is marked by her experience in Germany and by her own practice, her commitment to new objectivity and with it to photography as reproduction.